Heidi Seaman and Erica Botello. Heidi Lynn Seaman, an 11-year-old, was one of two daughters of Mr. and Mrs. Seaman. She had recently completed the fifth grade at Stahl Elementary and was enjoying her summer with family and friends. On August 4, 1990, Heidi was returning home from spending the night with one of her friends and was seen walking on Stahl Road on the northeast side of the town. This was the last time she was seen alive. When Heidi didn't return home, her parents reported her missing. For the next 21 days, a massive search involving thousands of people scoured the city and countryside. Civilians and military personnel worked side by side and tracking dogs, helicopters and horses were deployed, but with no luck. Then, on 23rd August 1990, another girl, Erika Botello, was abducted while playing outside her southwest side apartment complex. Heidi and Erika's body would eventually be discovered on the same day. Heidi's decomposing body was found stuffed into two duct tape bound trash bags along a rural road near Wembley, Texas, 60 miles north of San Antonio. Erika's body was found in a storm drain less than a mile from her home. The funerals of both girls were held on August 29th. Both girls had been sexually assaulted, then strangled and discarded by their captors. At the time, it was believed that both girls were kidnapped by the same person, but later, the police determined that the murders were not related. Suspects were named in both homicides. In Heidi's case, investigators focused on Robert Eric Duncan, an Air Force major who worked with Heidi's father at Randolph Air Force Base as their prime suspect. A co-worker told investigators Duncan had once threatened to get even with Heidi's father because of a dispute at work. But Duncan was never charged and has repeatedly denied having anything to do with the murder. He even helped lead the search efforts for Heidi in the days following her disappearance. In Erica's case, one man accused of murdering Erica was deemed mentally retarded and incompetent to stand trial and was sent to San Antonio State Hospital. Another suspect provided an alibi that he was at work during the time of the abduction and a third was released for lack of evidence. Heidi became the namesake of Heidi Search Center, while Erica's story faded to the background. No one has been charged with the murder, and both cases remain unsolved. Kim Siu Leggett Kim Siu Leggett was last seen on October 9, 1984, at her place of work in Mercedes, Texas. Kim, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, 21-year-old employee at Ross Cotton Gin, helped a customer weigh a load of produce he had brought in around 4.30 p.m. A few minutes later, Kim was spotted talking casually with two men by her car. The same customer she had helped at 4.30 p.m. came back around 5 p.m. with more produce to be weighed, but couldn't find Kim anywhere. No one could find her. It was as if she vanished in thin air. Strangely enough, 15 minutes prior, at around 4.45 p.m., Kim's mother and father received a mysterious phone call, claiming Kim had been kidnapped and asking for ransom. Thinking the phone call was a prank, but worried nonetheless, Kim's father called her at work to make sure she was okay. But by that time, no one was answering the phone. Kim's parents were adequately worried at this point, so they decided to drive to Cotton Gin to speak to her in person. There, they found an unsettling sight. Kim's car was still at work with keys and purse inside, but Kim was nowhere to be seen. Her office still showed signed off active work, with the business calculator still on and running, and books open. Kim's family later received a strange ransom note asking for $250,000. But what was most unsettling was that it seemed to have been written in Kim's own handwriting, although the envelope it was sent in was seemingly written by someone else. Kim was not the type to just run off. She left behind her extremely worried husband and a one-year-old son. 
Kim's husband was initially viewed as a potential suspect, but was later ruled out. Besides the husband angle, police also investigated the rumor surrounding Kim's stepfather, who was a pilot in what is now the commemorative Air Force. It was said that he was pressured to smuggle drugs and weapons into Mexico, but refused, and that Kim was abducted in retaliation for his refusal. But there is little to no evidence to substantiate this claim. Eventually, Kim's husband, who cooperated fully with the investigators, obtained a divorce from Kim, which raised eyebrows, but police have never found any hard evidence to support his involvement. To this day, Kim's case remains unsolved. Ruth Penelope Bell Penny Bell, as most people knew her, was born in 1948. Penny lived with her husband, Alastair Bell, at Bakerswood, Denham, Buckinghamshire. Alastair was an estate agent and Penny was a partner in Cover Staff Limited, a successful catering employment agency based in Kilburn. At the time, their family home was undergoing extensive renovations valued at £100,000. On 6th June 1991, Penny left her home in her powder blue Jaguar XJS at around 9.40am, telling workmen who were doing jobs on her house that she was off to an appointment. However, this appointment was not noted in her diary. Later, she was found stabbed to death in her car in Perryville Greenford in West London. It is believed that Bell was murdered around 10.30 am. At about 11 am, a passerby had seen Bell motionless in the driver's seat of a car in the Gurnall Leisure Centre car park and assumed she was sleeping. It wasn't until 12.15 pm that the police were alerted and her death was discovered. She had been stabbed 50 times in the chest and arms with a 3 to 4 inch blade. A forensic investigation determined that the killer had stabbed Bell from the passenger seat before exiting the car and frantically stabbing her from the driver's window. Police believed that Acker would have been heavily blood stained following the murder. Later, some witnesses came forward and told police that on the day of the murder, they recalled a blue Jaguar driving along Greenford Road at about 10 am at 10 to 15 miles per hour with its hazard lights flashing. A van driver even told police that he had seen a man wrestling with a blonde woman in a blue Jaguar driving slowly with its hazard lights flashing. As he overtook the Jaguar, he saw the woman try to pull the car on the side of the road, but her male passenger grabbed the wheel and forced her to continue driving. The car then turned towards the leisure centre. The passenger was described as about 40 with dark hair and possibly a beard. He was wearing a bracelet on his right hand. Six months after the murder, another witness came forward saying that they had seen her in the car with another man, mouthing the words, help me, which he had ignored. The witness was in a car which overtook Penny who was deliberately driving slowly, creating a traffic jam. Several cars overtook her, blasting their horns, but no one had stopped to help. The authorities do not believe that robbery was the motive, and Penny was most likely killed by someone she knew. It was later found that Penny had withdrawn £8,500 from her and her husband's joint bank account on 3rd June 1991. Yet, this was not noted in any of her record books. She was meticulous with money, keeping record of every withdrawal, except this one. The money remains unaccounted for. At first, police suspected Alastair Bell as the killer, as he inherited the bulk of his wife's estate, as well as a £200,000 life insurance payout. But Alastair Bell's corroborated movements ruled him out as the murderer. In a bizarre twist, family friend John Richmond offered to reveal the events leading up to the murder in return for £80,000 from a newspaper. Richmond, a builder, was eventually arrested in connection with the attack 
after his fingerprints were found in the Jaguar, but he was released. He claimed Penny was the victim of a contract killer and that he was the mystery man Penny set out to meet. Richmond said that they were having a secret relationship and met to discuss sleeping together. However, senior detectives do not know how much weight to attach to his story. He has not been helpful in the police interviews and they later dismissed his claims. Despite interviewing thousands of people, no one has been charged with her murder. There's a £20,000 reward for any information regarding the case. Elizabeth Campbell On the evening of April 25th, 1988, 20-year-old Central Texas college student Elizabeth Campbell went to her boyfriend's home in Killeen to study for a final exam. At some point, Elizabeth had a fight with her boyfriend, Ricky Ray. She took her books and stormed out of his house sometime between 9.30 and 11 p.m. Elizabeth lived with her parents in Limpazes, which was 30 miles away. But a motorist gave her a ride to a copperous cove and dropped her off at a 7-Eleven. There, Elizabeth decided to call her boyfriend and asked him to give her a ride to her home. They got into an another argument. She then told him that she would call her parents and have them pick her up. However, she never called them and decided to call her brother instead. This would have been a long distance call and she didn't want to make it on the store's phone. So, she went outside to use the payphone. This would be the last time she was heard from again. When she failed to turn up, her family and friends started looking for her, distributing thousands of flyers throughout Texas. Police suspected that she may have been abducted and murdered. Campbell's parents went to the Central Texas College campus and were able to locate the man who dropped her off at the 7-Eleven. He said that on that night, he had been working late at the college computer lab, saw Campbell walking down the service road and recognized her as a fellow student at the college. He offered her a ride to Copper's Cove, which was as far as he was going. The 7-Eleven where he had dropped her off was about 17 miles from her home. At one point, her mother traveled to a gas station near Waco, 85 miles from where Elizabeth was last seen and the convenience store clerk actually recognized Elizabeth from her flyer. The clerk told her that six days after Elizabeth vanished, a girl matching her description came into the store. She was accompanied by an unidentified Asian man who was holding her forcibly by her arm and looked very possessive of her. The man gave the clerk $20 and when the girl looked up at the clerk, he asked her if he could help her. The man said something to her in a language that the clerk didn't understand and she dropped her head and looked down, as if she was being punished for trying to say something. They both left the store quickly after that. Then, a few days later, a clerk at a convenience store in Copperas Cove also recognized Elizabeth from her flyer. Again, the girl was entering the store with a man and again, he was holding her by her arm and made sure that she didn't talk. Another sighting of Elizabeth took place on July 10th at a gas station in Garland, 150 miles away from Copper's Cove. A customer claimed that she bumped into her as she was leaving the store. The girl acted as if she was frightened and that she was being watched by someone. When the witness saw the flyer, she was certain that it was her because she had a tooth that overlapped on the right side. Authorities, however, were skeptical that these women were actually Elizabeth. But Elizabeth's parents fear that she was abducted and is being forced to walk on the streets as a prostitute. The man seen with the girl resembling Elizabeth is described as 5'7", 160 pounds, has acne scars on his face, may pluck his eyebrows and would now be in his 50s. He was seen wearing a silver martial arts medallion with a golden chain. Four years after Elizabeth vanished, her purse was found in the evidence room of the Crockett County Sheriff's Office in Rizzoli, about 300 miles west of Corpus Cove. Authorities believe that someone had turned it up into the department, but they never recorded who had done this 
Owen. Afute stated that there was no physical evidence relating to Campbell's disappearance inside the purse. It contained her social security card, military identification card and credit card, but her makeup, her brush and keys were missing. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance and her case remains unsolved.